it is the early morning and the working day of the steam locomotive and its crew is just beginning the golden age of the steam railway was built on foundations of hard work on skilled work on dedication how often are steam locomotives described as being alive, as more animal than machine, as living, breathing creatures? Creatures, machines, that have personality. Just like living creatures, locomotives need tending, feeding, watering, and grooming. The working day of a steam locomotive begins early with a full ritual of preparation before taking to the road. Fires to be lit, steam to be raised, with feeding and watering. The joints and tendons through which pass the locomotive's power and strength need to be lubricated and exercised. Light oils and heavier greases for the running gear as metal slides up against and over metal at high speeds. Heavy oils for the cylinders designed to atomize under the heat and pressures of the locomotive to become microscopic particles flowing into the cylinders and valves along with the steam. The smell of the emulsified oil and steam mixture giving rise to one of the distinctive sensations of the steam railway. In the golden age of the steam railway, the steam locomotive reached its greatest ever level of technical sophistication. It was a time when the art of locomotive design attained its greatest achievements. And it was a time when some lucky passengers were carried in incredible comfort and style. The era of railway history begins in the aftermath of the Great War, when the multitude of British railways, large, small and tiny, were struggling to recover from both the ravages of war, when the system was overworked, and face up to the great hardships of the twenties, which were beginning to bite. The government looked to rationalize the system, and in 1923 had created four new companies, the Big Four. The Southern Railway is perhaps one of the less fanatically admired by today's enthusiasts, yet it presents a fascinating picture. Its role in the economy was a carrier of people, more than a carrier of freight. The Southern Network was a key part of the commuter-based world of the southeast of England. In this, the Southern was perhaps more like a modern railway than the rest of the Big Four. The Southern was a railway which looked outwards to Europe and the world, linking to France with cross-channel services and the great ocean liners through Southampton. The London and North Eastern was formed from the railways which ran up the East Coast all the way to Scotland. Its trains served the rural depths of East Anglia and much of northern industrial England. The LMS, the London, Midland and Scottish Railway, was an amalgamation of already large railways to form the largest single railway system in the world. 
its lines ran into almost all parts of the British Isles. LMS trains penetrated the farthest reaches of the Scottish Highlands, the West Country in Bristol, the industrial Midlands, and above all, served the West Coast route to Scotland. The Great Western was less of an amalgamation, having retained an identity founded in 1840. It ran fast trains from Paddington over lines laid down by Brunel. It bore the produce of the agricultural West Country to London. The GWR also had a dirty industrial face, covered in the grime of the South Wales coal fields. Its continuity of tradition made the Great Western distinctly aloof to trends and fads. The Great Western's engines retained a distinctive style. The world of the Big Four was the world of the classic steam railway. It was a different place to that which we know today. This film from the late 1920s was shot from the Flying Scotsman Express on its run from King's Cross. Its journey is a slice right through the world of classic steam railway. This was a time when you could tell where you were just by the type of coach on which you rode. King's Cross is being left behind by a rake of the distinctive teak stock of the LNER, a pattern and style inherited from the older Great Northern Railway. The engine is an A3 Pacific, one of the first of the big new express classes that were to become icons of this era in railway history. The express speeds through a station. Past centre balance semaphore signals typical of the former great northern sections of the LNER. Some distance from London the train picks up water from troughs necessary to ensure non-stop running. The fireman would lower a scoop under the tender and the speed of the train would force thousands of gallons up into the tanks, often washing the coaches of the train at the same time. Further north, and the design of the signals have changed, telling us we are now in the part of the LNER that was formerly the territory of the old Northeastern Railway one of Britain's smaller but richer railways. The track landscape was much busier and cluttered in these times. Here, the express travels past siding, servicing factories and goods stations. The railways played a far more important role, moving freight and goods. This tangled weave of tracks with forests of signals and even a signal box perched up out of the way over the rails show us a time when more trains had separate locomotives and trains were far more often broken apart and recombined in complicated shunting operations. It was a time when locomotives needed servicing and refueling far more often. Track arrangements had to be more complicated just to make all these movements possible. The train overtakes goods traffic past a mixture of wagons privately owned and belonging to other railways. In some ways, it is the railway's role as a mover of freight that has changed the most since the classic age of the steam railway. This view of the approaches to London on the LNER in the early 30s presents a sharp contrast to the living museum. Locomotives, perhaps not the cleanest, hustle back and forth with regular, ordinary, everyday trains at which no one is staring, pointing, or getting excited in the least. Expresses were such a major feature of the interwar years. There were far more expresses in those times, non-stop trains between the major cities. Today, we have almost no true expresses at all. Amazingly, for a smaller country as Britain, the Plymouth to Paddington and King's Cross to Edinburgh journeys were rated the longest non-stop runs in the world.
The design of new locomotives was a subject of great public interest. Locomotives were stars. They went on tours of the United States and featured in cinema newsreels. 5,000 people are here to view the Royal Scot. England's crack train en route to Chicago for the World's Fair. Now, cheerio, everybody, right away. We're not on our tours. The LMS Royal Scot was in fact a borrowed design from the Southern Railway. Here is a close Southern relative. A second look of the Royal Scot shows the family resemblance. This is Britain's most powerful engine, built by the London Midland and Scottish Railway to haul in the heavy Scots trains between Euston and Glasgow. maiden journey of the new locomotive on the LMS Scottish run. The engine has been named after Her Royal Highness the Princess Royal and she is expected to break all records. When the first 100 miles per hour journey was made is debatable. The GWR had a claim, but the first indisputable ton was only achieved by LNER A3 Pacific 4472 Flying Scotsman in 1934. In the interwar years, the science of aerodynamics brought a new understanding of the way in which air flows over surfaces, either aiding or hindering speed. The new knowledge began to be applied to other technologies, including locomotives, and was turned into an aesthetic. To be streamlined was to be at the cutting edge of style and fashion. But the new locomotives were streamlined on the inside, owing most of their power and speed to the application of the new scientific principles to the design of their arteries, their internal steam circuits, rather than their glamorous casings. In truth, the external streamlining was mostly a style statement. The streamliners of the LNER and the LMS were the products of an intense competition between the two railways, which had routes of similar length between London and Scotland, and which lent themselves to high-speed non-stop running. It was a competition which, of course, went back to the very start of railways in this country. It is important to separate competition in terms of technology, a battle of invention and innovation, and competition in terms of public image, what we would call today the PR war. It mattered just as much which railways trains were thought of as the best as which railways trains were the best. Were these splendid engines the triumphs of British technology, which they are so often called? It's hard to say. The British designers Stanier of the LMS and Gresley of the LNER made extensive use of new scientific theories of locomotive design developed by French engineers, in particular André Chapillon. These ideas lay beneath the skin of the locomotives. They were changes which gave the locomotive a bigger heart and bigger lungs. It was not just the locomotive, but carriages which were built to new standards of comfort and design air-conditioned and double-glazed with cocktail bars and hairdressers. The LNER and the LMS competed to hold the world speed record, leapfrogging each other with ever higher speeds. The LNER actually called its new trains high-speed trains, predating its modern use by 40 years. 
It was in July 1938 that the LNER achieved the record of 126 miles per hour, which still stands. It's important to put the streamliners in perspective. Most of the British railway system was run by locomotives that were old in 1930. In 1939, the speeds of the LNER's non-streamlined services were not much faster than in 1913. The everyday train that did not get into the newsreel belonged to a world that had a different idea of distance to that we know today. Then there were no long-distance commuters as today. Even from towns in today's terms as close as 200 miles, the first trains might not reach London much before midday. Trains were not crowded. There was a vast oversupply of seats. For some cities, there were as many as five different competing routes from London. Not having a compartment all to yourself was regarded as a hardship. Trains were longer and heavier than today. Fifteen coaches were not unusual. Stepping down in the railway hierarchy, a cross-country stopping passenger train calls at a rather quiet rural station on the Great Western. The locomotive is a 440 with a train of, what else, rather old-fashioned Great Western coaches. If many of the grander express trains were of what today would be unusual lengths, in rural areas, on country branch lines, services might be made up of just a locomotive, perhaps a small tank engine, and a few coaches. Here, somewhere on the LMS, an 060 Jinty hurries by with its train. But one wonders just what happened on this day, as an S15 460 makes light work of a two-coach southern train. It is the rural surface which has perhaps disappeared most from the British landscape. The typical sleepy country station with a handful of trains visited by a stopping goods service which would pick up perhaps just one wagon could not survive in any form into the present day. Here, one of the smallest classes of Great Western engine brings its single coach train into what looks like the branch of a branch. All over the country, on all the railways, these small trains potted back and forth on picturesque routes, helping to knit together a world where people did not have second homes in the country. If today's long-distance commuter did not exist, the ordinary commuter certainly did. Here, an LNER steam commuter train arrives. Commuter service and steam do not go together. Engines which are only needed at peak times, yet have to be kept fired all day, are not economic. The electric train, which only costs when it works, is an obvious improvement. This view of the approaches to London Bridge show that the Southern Railway was the very first of the big four to make the big decision to make a huge investment in a major electrification, building new trains and laying supply the whole length of the line. The advantages of electric power and suburban commuter services are obvious. Electrification meant that on the Southern Lines into London, the railway was able to run twice as many trains in the 15 years between the wars. This increase in service was both caused by and the cause of the growth of the southeast, whereby the suburbs feeding London seemed to extend many miles from the capital. Perhaps the first sign of the end for steam was the first electrified main line, on the southern, the line to Brighton. In the classic age of the steam railway, special trains, non-scheduled services at holiday time, or to a special event were far more common. Today, Football supporters travel by car or coach. In the past, these journeys were made by train. During the interwar years, people first gained the legal right to paid holidays. Blackpool alone in the 1930 season received 22,000 trains carrying over 3 million passengers. This doubled to over 6 million by 1935. This massive summer demand might at first seem a good thing. In fact, it was a burden as the railways had to store and maintain a huge reserve fleet of carriages and locomotives, only earning revenue a few months a year. Less than a third of the total rolling stock was in everyday use. The expresses of the southern connected to Europe.
the Golden Arrow crossed the channel to become the Flesh d'Or. Other southern trains connected with the great ocean liners at Southampton. It was in goods transport that the railways first began to face stiff competition. The fact that railways had to work under legal restrictions with prices set by the government, laws dating back from the 19th century, a time when they had a monopoly of goods transport, meant that road haulage had an unfair edge. In the late 30s, a campaign was begun, fair play for the railways. In this 1939 newsreel, the chairman of the LMS, Lord Stamp, argues his case. Station entrances and hoardings in Britain have been placarded with arresting slogans during the past fortnight. Perturbed by the ominous words, we asked Lord Stamp what it was all about. He told us that there had been a five million drop in railway receipts this year. It seems that the terms on which railways operate were fixed a hundred years ago before there was any road transport to challenge their supremacy. Road transport, which has become so efficient in recent years, is not bound by the limitations which Parliament put upon the railway monopoly of those early years. So despite the strenuous efforts made by the railway systems to meet competition by new rolling stock, improvement of services and acceleration of time schedules on the long run, they still find themselves handicapped by the regulations devised all those many years ago. Having seen the arrival at Euston of the Coronation Scot, in case you wondered what train it was, we'll have a final word from Lord Stamp. Our receipts are dropping alarmingly. Matters are urgent. Prosperous railways are essential to prosperous commerce and therefore to a prosperous nation. They could not be ready to help in wartime if they are weak in peacetime. All we are asking for is a square deal, a fair field and no favour. In 1939, with Europe once more on the edge of a world war, Britain's railways presented a story of mixed fortune. The PR department of the LMS was hard at work sending another locomotive on an American tour. Good luck by Lord Stamp. Well, goodbye, Bishop. You have plenty of good advice, so I won't give you any more. But you're going over and we know you'll uphold the credit of Britain and British Railway. Goodbye to you, too. The train will shortly leave Southampton for its journey across the Atlantic. On the other side, a tour will be made embracing over 3,000 miles and 38 cities. And Americans will be able to compare the efficiency and luxurious appointment with those of their trains. After the tour, the Coronation Scot will be on show for six months at the New York World's Fair. It is possible to argue that if speeds and frequency of services were considered, 1939 Britain had the best passenger services in the world, and that Britain was one of the most railwayed countries in the world with more lines, more services, and more journeys per head than any other. On the other hand, a process of decline had already begun, with a constant grinding pressure of competition from road transport, which in many ways had inevitable and natural commercial advantages over the railway in the carriage of freight. Many rural lines were slipping into the long, slower journey that was to lead to the nemesis in the 1960s. Exodus from London takes place, young people whom their parents had wisely registered for evacuation taking train for the West Country. The railways provided one of the stages for the human drama of the Second World War. The railway platform and the departing train, whether carrying the evacuated child, the soldier, sailor or airman, or even the prisoner or displaced person, each and all travelling to unknown and fearful destinies, provide us with some of the most abiding images of the war years. One of the first jobs of the railway in Britain was to carry away the children of the cities and towns to be safe from air attack. This scene on the LNER shows something of the railway at war. This was a world where everybody seemed to be on the move, but everybody's journey had to be necessary. The war brought dramatic change to the entire railway network. War was declared on 3rd September. On the 4th, 
Plans for mobilization meant that the Great Western Railway alone ran 320 special troop trains and a further 350 carrying ammunition, fuel and other military supplies. These sequences are from a special series of films shot for the GWR, recording wartime conditions at various stations on the Great Western System in the week running up to Christmas in 1941. The film provides a quite vivid picture of travel under wartime conditions. The most dramatic change from peacetime is the sheer numbers crowding onto platforms and cramming into trains. When we remember that before the war there was actually an oversupply of trains, that it was a time when a traveller could enjoy space and privacy. It is clear that this was a world turned upside down. Quite simply, there were less trains as so much rolling stock and timetable space was taken over by military traffic. Trains became incredibly long, sometimes to a length of 26 coaches using two separate platforms. The first half of the train pulling out and then reversing on to pick up and couple with the rear portion. These enormous trains would then crawl slowly away, perhaps with every single space filled, perhaps blacked out through the night, perhaps stopped and shunted aside many times to make way for more important traffic. The railways were, of course, regarded as valid targets for strategic bombing. But if high priority was given to their targeting, then high priority was given to repairs. Damage to essential routes was quickly made good. Just as the RAF was defined in Germany, essential services could be quickly repaired and large and heavy pieces of capital equipment, solid pieces of heavy engineering such as steam locomotives, were actually quite hard to damage, so irreparably that the engine was lost completely. Figures show the surprising fact that throughout the entire war in the entire country, a total of only eight locomotives were completely destroyed by bombing. The sad fact is that while the damage caused by direct enemy assault was negligible and easily mended, the damage caused by overwork, neglect and government policy was far greater. Just as trains were worked doubly overloaded, so the railway system was doubly loaded both technically and financially during the war. Locomotives were not maintained to the standards necessary. They were made to soldier on with worn out parts, with neglect leading to greater damage. Just as with locomotive stock, so with the rolling stock and the permanent way. Both were sacrificed for victory. Even in the quality of fuel supplied for locomotives, the railways were asked to make sacrifices. Wartime conditions meant that the engines had to run on low-grade coal that reduced their performance and gave them a bad diet, magnifying the problems caused by the minimal maintenance. The human population was living on powdered egg. The locomotive population its carboniferous equivalent. Now it might be thought that as a result of all the extra traffic in both passengers and freight and the fact that double length crowded trains might be slow but they are very cost effective bringing a good return that the railways might have been highly profitable. In fact the government took steps to prevent the railways becoming war profiteers. The state clawed back all extra revenues leaving the railway companies with run down track, worn out engines, carriages and wagons an infrastructure almost inoperable, while denying the money and resources with which to make good the damage and return to health. Although many railway jobs are vital jobs, essential to war economy, there was still a labour shortage. Just as in all areas of British industry, women played their part in winning the war, taking the jobs of men who were away. Although not found on the footplate, women worked as locomotive cleaners, doing the dirty work of motive power departments all over the country. Women did the dangerous and demanding work of permanent way maintenance. Signal women controlled train movements on some of the busiest lines and were to be found in many of the maintenance branches of railway service. Women took the important role of train guard. And just as with all areas of British industry where women took a wartime role, these workers were to disappear back into the traditional women's world of the family and of home to the office and shop with the coming of peace. 
one wonders how many had regrets. Guns and tanks which had to be secretly concentrated and taken to the places of embarkation. Talk about stuff. 25,000 special trains ran in the two months up to D-Day, transporting the armies of many nations. The railways were a crucial part of the war economy that brought victory. ...military equipment of every kind and with their complement of fighting men, American and British, deserves the highest possible praise. The vast majority of people intended to make the most of their first post-war Easter. As it was, the people put up with the crush and the railways coped with the... This newsreel from 1946 shows the first holiday period. The sight of a coronation streamliner now shrouded in plain black, painfully pulling away with a multitude of leaks, shows the neglect endured during the war. In some places, there were attempts to get back to normal. ...the golden arrow train, in which you can travel in complete comfort to the coast. After crossing the channel, you board the train again in front. If only this kind of travel were typical of journeys everywhere in Britain. But, well, maybe that's too much to hope for yet. It would be very wrong to say that the railways in the post-war period were either standing still or simply trying to recapture old glory. There was innovation, improvement and progress. The LMS built the first mainline diesel. And here is a newsreel report of the first mainline electric locomotive built for the London and North Eastern Railway to work the old Great Central mainline. The sight of what is a comparatively modern-looking locomotive, decked out in the lettering and livery of one of the old Big Four railways, must be a thought-provoking sight to the modern eye, in a time when liveries change by the day. Just as the Great War of 1914-18 brought massive change on Britain's railways, so World War II brought about the most significant of changes, full state control, nationalisation. The new Labour government of Clement Attlee was pledged to nationalisation for reasons of socialist principle rather than railway practicalities. The big idea that was never carried through was to also nationalise road transport, canals and docks and create a completely coordinated national transport policy. Here at Derby Works in 1948, a former LMS locomotive rolls out anew for those of you watching in black and white, green livery. It's often said by defenders of state control that nationalization was completely inevitable due to the state of the system in the post-war years. The GWR was the only company to have made anything like a realistic profit in 1939. The LNER and the LMS, for all their glamour, were almost insolvent. In fact, it was the effect of state control during the war that had brought the railways to such a sorry condition. It was the state that had starved the railways of income during the war, and the state that had caused the system to be thrashed into the ground through a lack of money for replacements and repairs. So was there an alternative to nationalization? Yes, the state could have repaid the debts. It literally owed the railways for their sacrifice in the war. This would have given the railways the resources to rebuild, to expand. The private railway companies could have expanded into road haulage, bus companies and air transport, as they were doing before the war, and produced a coordinated policy based on commercial reality rather than political belief. And we would today have the position of railways owning the bus and coach companies. There was a huge need for new investment in what today we call the infrastructure of the railways. But post-war Britain had a huge shopping list with the creation of the National Health Service, the welfare state, and improvements in education, and rebuilding the railways was a step too far. As it was, what really changed were the names painted on the side of the engines, and that decisions which should have been based on sound railway operation began to be taken by civil servants and politicians. What did the people of Britain get? They got 20,023 locomotives in 448 different types. 16 electric locomotives, 53 diesels, just under one and a quarter million wagons of 480 different types, just under 20,000 route miles of track. At nationalization, the railway employed an astounding 700,000 people. A fascinating side story to the tale of nationalization is that the act of parliament that took the railways into state control actually made no reference to the name British Railways. The new system was created, but it had no formal name.
and the title British Railways was an improvisation. If there was a national British Railway, was there such a thing as a typical British locomotive? If there is a typical British locomotive, it is the 060, be it an 060 tender or an 060 tank. These locos were the staple workhorses to be found on freight and passenger traffic alike. At nationalisation of the 20,000 engines British Railways owned, more than one in three were 060s. When BR came to build its own locomotives, no 060s were built. Locomotive policy was one of the first areas where the new British Railways had to go to work and integrate the big four into one system. It was decided in 1951 to build a whole new family of standard locomotives that could eventually work the whole system, just ten designs. The wisdom of this is debatable. Other developed countries were investing in diesel and electric traction. Only three years later, the decision was taken to phase out steam altogether on Britain's railways, a wasteful change of mind. Many of those locomotives built in the 1950s would have had useful lives nearly to the present day. What was the idea, the basic thought that guided the designers of these standard locomotives? Maximum steam raising capacity, huge efficient boilers for each type of loco to guarantee plenty of power, high thermal efficiency making maximum use of the energy from the coal burned with large grates and internal steam circuitry and valves of the highest standards, simplicity as few working parts to look after and those parts to be easily reached and on view. For example on this standard five locomotive there is a simple arrangement of just two outside cylinders. There are no difficult to get at internal cylinders and motion. Key components were to be highly engineered, drawing on the lessons and developments in technology that the war had brought. The tender of the class 5 has roller bearings on its axles, more reliable and needing far less maintenance. The idea of low maintenance and higher efficiency is carried throughout the design of the locomotive. The locomotive is fitted with a then innovatory oil pump, a mechanical oiler here being primed. This reduced the number of individual oilings needed before each journey. Some parts of the locomotive had sealed lubricating points, again all leading to less expensive labour and time in preparing the engine for the road. For there was drastic need to cut labour costs as people were far more expensive in the post-war years and had far higher expectations. A low-paid job, which involved getting up very early to work with dirty and hot locomotives, did not attract applicants in the 50s. Of course, the extensive ritual of oiling and general preparation was still time-consuming, and that time spent before the run was mirrored by a long period spent disposing of the engine after a run. Equally, the new engines were to be easier to put to bed at night, with features such as a self-cleaning smoke box to remove one of the most dirty and unpleasant tasks in tending to steam locomotives. Wheel arrangement and weight were optimized to ensure good adhesion and minimal slipping, making the new locomotives extremely sure-footed. The locos were to have the range of power and speed such that each class could handle mixed traffic be as happy handling an express or a freight. Pulling a light train very fast or a heavy train powerfully if slowly. These last steam locomotives to be built include among their number some of the most spectacular successes in locomotive design. In many ways, they succeeded in the aim of bringing together some of the very best principles from each of the old big four.
It is a sadness, a waste of human ingenuity, that so many good working locomotives were to have such a short working life. There was an attempt in some places to get things back to normal. The Golden Arrow had resumed its run to the Channel very soon after the end of the war. This precursor to the Eurostar was an exercise in luxury. Passengers travelled in first-class Pullman comfort and transferred to ship for the Channel crossing. The war had so run down the system, poorly maintained track cannot stand fast running, that it was not until 1953 that any of the major long distance non-stop expresses like the Golden Arrow began to reach pre-war standards. While the former southern lines were returning to the old glamour of continental travel, on the east coast route to Scotland, there was an attempt to recreate the pre-war years of the LNER. The train was called the Elizabethan. London, 9.35 a.m., and from King's Cross, a new train, the Elizabethan, sets out to inaugurate the Coronation Year Express service at Edinburgh, the longest non-stop railway journey in the world. Aboard, the passengers settle down, some to their morning pick-me-up, or maybe that breakfast they missed. We leave them in comfort, while we film from almost every angle the thrills of this epic run, recalling those former pre-war record journeys to the north. Crossing the border, we average nearly a mile a minute and arrive at Waverley Station, Edinburgh, on time. 392 miles in six and three-quarter hours. A record for a non-stop journey. The time, 4.20 p.m. So the Elizabethan starts a new age in railway history. Once the PR story is cleared aside, this new train was still three-quarters of an hour slower than the 1939 timetable. Overall, most running times were even slower than those in 1913. In the West Country, the Cornish Riviera Express was revived. Here, the train stands awaiting the all-clear as befitting one of the most famous trains to work from Paddington. As it should be, the locomotive is a powerful king of the Great Western Railway. Watch for the porter walking through shot as the locomotive leaves. What has he been doing in front of the locomotive?
Steam locomotives, more than any other form of transport, give the feel of a living creature, of something that has to be fed. This scene of coaling is timeless, something that's been happening for 150 years. Fed and watered, of something that has to be nursed through its journey. A locomotive is not the easiest of things to drive well. Now, each and every type of transport that people use has its own feel. What then is the feel of being in the cab, of driving a locomotive? In some ways, driving a locomotive is like the more familiar experience of driving a car. When starting, selecting a low gear, a late cutoff on the reversing gear, taking off the brake, pressing the accelerator, opening the regulator to send power to the wheels, the engine slowly starts to move. Steel wheels on steel rails do not move with the same response of rubber on tarmac, and the locomotive is gently encouraged up to speed. Once moving and picking up speed, the cutoff is changed, the equivalent of changing to a higher gear. Driving of steam locomotive is, of course, a two-person job, with extra work from the fireman in response to the engine working harder. The fireman watches steam pressure and water level, and has a cab floor to be kept clear of loose coal. The engine beats faster as it works harder, climbing, doing more work, burning more coal. None of the great engineers ever satisfactorily solved the simple problem of looking past a long boiler barrel to watch ahead and spot signals. So it is a job of both crew to work together, look forward, checking both signals and the road ahead. Knowledge of the road is important to driving all trains, more so on steam, when so much has to be done in addition to simply driving. The sensation of the cab is one of noise, of vibration, of being in the open air, directly aware of the environment through which the train runs, of feeling the locomotive work, of understanding its condition by vibration and sound, rather than the simple inspection of dial and gauges. This was a time when engine crews had more contact with others on the railway. For engine crews in the age of steam, the signalman was not a remote presence many miles away. Trains were not controlled by automatic signals. This film, shot in an LNER box, is one of the earliest automatic power-controlled signal systems. It does not control a main line, but a freight marshalling yard. The railways in the post-nationalization period endured increasing competition, particularly in the carriage of freight. 
The goods train in the past was a different animal. Freight was dealt with by the wagon. Individual trucks and vans went all around the country, attached to stopping freight trains, sorted and moved around in marshalling yards. It is hard to believe, but until 1953, there were legal restrictions on people moving their own goods in their own lorries. When these controls were lifted, a heavy blow was struck against rail freight. This process of shunting, sorting and rearranging trains became hopelessly uncompetitive compared to a road transport network delivering door to door. There were attempts made to rationalize the system by using these automated yards. In effect, these yards only delayed the impact of competition. Even with automation, the process still required an army of shunters to couple and uncouple the different wagons and sort the trains into the correct order. The work of the shunter running alongside heavy moving wagons, riding on the brake lever, appears to be hair-raisingly dangerous. In the yards, sometimes not just single trucks, but strings of wagons moved on their own with no locomotive. Shunting was a job requiring some strength and coordination. This shunter sprints alongside the trucks, while at the same time inserting the brake stick to work the wagon's own brakes. The railways were still, as today, one of the safest ways to travel. But in the 50s, newsreel cameras recorded a series of horrifying accidents. Four coaches plunged down the embankment after it. The train was an excursion from Wales. The immediate fatalities were 10, and the number of injured about 100. Nearly 300 passengers were aboard the train, and many miraculous escapes were reported, including that of the engine driver and the farmer. These pictures reveal the extent of the disaster. There are the points which possibly caused the accident. It took hours before the main line was cleared. It was about a mile from Welling Garden City that the night express from Aberdeen crashed into the rear of a local train. Many coaches of the express were derailed and flung over onto their sides. But almost miraculously, there was only one fatality among the total of about 600 passengers traveling in the two trains. The lines were blocked till the next day, and the cause of the collision, potentially a very grave disaster, awaits close investigation. Sutton Coalfield Station was closed and empty when the York to Bristol Express was derailed there. But all possible help was quickly on the spot and the work of rescue went on through the night. When the engine left the track, some reports say it jumped the points, nine out of 10 coaches piled up into this terrifying mass of wreckage. The train was carrying about 300 passengers at the time. Railwaymen were quick to avert another disaster by succeeding in halting the Birmingham to York Express, 200 yards short of the wreckage. An early casualty list put the fatalities at 16 and injured many of them very seriously at over 40. Deep sympathy for those bereaved and all who suffered in this tragic accident has everywhere been expressed. happened after six o'clock in the evening in thick fog, the worst railway accident in the history of the southern region, and one of the worst in the history of British railways. A steam train from London to Ramsgate crashed into the rear of an electric train to Hayes, which was stationary between St John's and Lewisham stations. The collision wasn't all, for a bridge, the Nunhead flyover, was also involved in the crash, and it collapsed onto the last coach of the steam train. All through the night, rescue workers toiled by the light of flares to extricate the living, the injured, and the dead. 
the trains had been full of businessmen, rush hour travelers, and Christmas shoppers. Casualties were very heavy. Over 70 deaths were soon reported, and the toll was expected to be even greater. The frightful pile-up on the line was now a little clearer to see, and looking at it, the reason for the heavy casualty list became obvious. To all the bereaved, and to all who suffered in this appalling tragedy, the deepest sympathy is everywhere expressed. The experience of the steam railway was more than simply the sight, sound and smell of the steam locomotive. The experience of the steam railway was the total of a mass of small details. The sound of trucks and wagons which were simply chained together rather than precisely coupled. Of a world which was lit not by electricity but by oil lamps. Even there. Oil lamps shone down on a pre microwave, pre fiber optic world with a communications technology worked with simple telegraph wires. Signaling, which was mechanical, mirroring and mimicking human gesture, where the area control was limited by a man's strength conveyed through wire and rod. Even the sound of wheel running on rail in the classic age was different. This was a time when 60-foot lengths of rail, bolted, not welded together, sat wedged in place by wooden keys and cast iron chairs, bolted to wooden sleepers. Trains don't sound like this anymore. beginning of the end came in 1960. Swindon and a new locomotive that's already historic. The last steam loco to be built by British Railways. The official unveiling revealed its appropriate name. Evening Star points to the inevitable end of a very popular age, the age of steam. It's always been locos like this that made boys want to be engine drivers. An innocent might ask, why aren't steam locomotives used anymore? The answer is simple. What would you have to pay someone to tend to a steam locomotive's needs? Laboring for money rather than love. What a steam locomotive wants, what it needs, is a lot. A lot of care and attention. This great western manor class 460 has spent a day working up and down the preserved Seven Valley Railway. It has finished its day's work. But for those whose task it is to care for this engine, to make certain it stays a healthy engine, the day's work is not even half over. The first task is to coal the locomotive. It is easier to move to the coal when there is steam than to move a locomotive without steam.
the crew of a steam locomotive cannot switch off, lock up and go home. As the engine returns to its base, people gather around, each waiting to play their role in the rituals of engine disposal. At one end, new fuel is loaded into the tender. Meanwhile, at the other, one of the most unpleasant jobs on the steam railway begins. As coal burns, and just as any fuel, it does not burn completely, some ash remains. While the locomotive is running, this ash is sucked through the boiler tubes. Some is blown out through the chimney, but some gathers and collects in the smoke box. For all but a small number of engines, there is no alternative but for someone to open the hot smoke box and shovel the ash out. Shovel by hot, dirty and dusty shovel, to do the thorough job needed means to get right inside the box of the still hot locomotive reaching right inside with special tools to reach into every nook and cranny of the engine. In the cab, a start is made on cleaning the fire. The smoke box door is cleaned to make certain of the airtight fit, which is needed when running for the engine's exhaust system to do its job properly. The door is screwed very tight. the engine rolls forward on its remaining steam. The engine will now remain static for the rest of its disposal. the boiler is filled with water. Once again, this is something much harder to do with a cold engine, as boiler pressure is needed to work the injectors, the taps connecting the tender to boiler. This gradually cools the engine and reduces the boiler pressure. Then comes the task of removing the fire. Again, on some of the more modern engines, the fire can be dropped through the bottom of the firebox. But here, it has to be shoveled out by hand and dropped through the floor of the cab. Hot work, cramped work, using cumbersome large tools in a small space. It is this, the simple amount of labor needed to make the engines work that brought about the end of steam.
wild steam locos, nothing to touch them. Their days are numbered and the real veterans are being broken up. Here at Swindon, where many thousands have been built over the past hundred years or so, the old timers are being turned into scrap. Rather sad, really. And it does seem a harsh fate after all the faithful service they've given. Most of this lot date from the 1920s. But they won't be quite forgotten. There's a big demand for the old number plates as souvenirs for collectors. Still progress is progress, I suppose, and British Railways must diesel up. When he joined the Incredibly, railway, steam on Britain's railways lasted only a little longer than horses. The last shunting horse ending service in 1967. For the past six years, he's been at Newmarket Station pulling horse boxes for racehorses. But Charlie's had his share of the limelight. Two years ago, he appeared at the Horse of the Year show. Why employ horses on the railways? Well, it keeps the grass down on the platforms. Anyway, grass will now be playing a big part in Charlie's life. He's retiring to be replaced by a diesel. Obviously, Charlie's driver regrets the change, feels daft patting a diesel, and they do absolutely nothing for the gun. As it became clear that an age was about to pass away, people began to realize that the steam railway was a thing worth saving. Here, 4472 Flying Scotsman, 40 years on, now as British Railways 60103. is about to pass into private ownership and preservation. The engine was to be followed by many more.
These scenes are typical of the last days of steam. A stopping passenger train pulls into a small rural station. Sadly, no one gets out. An express double-headed by Class 5 460s has just overtaken a heavy freight. The freight, hauled by a Class 9 210, the same class as Evening Star. West Country, a small local train hurries by on a branch line, perhaps soon to be axed. On the Great Western Main Line, a castle destined for scrap thunders by. What would enthusiasts give to spend a day just watching through these windows overlooking the Paddington approaches in the early 1960s? Today, the names of the old railways live on the preserved lines of Britain. Locomotives, perhaps with new boilers and new wheels, still work, perhaps on lines that are a little too small for their power. The names of famous expresses live on, adorning locomotives that are not perhaps quite right, as the stars of countless home movies. The steam locomotive is probably one of those technologies which, if it were to be invented today, would not be allowed.
bean counting accountant will give a host of reasons why you cannot run a commercial railway based on burning coal to boil water to make steam. The truth remains that as long as there are steam locomotives in this world, there will be people who will want to clean them, oil them, fire them, drive them, photograph them, film them. There will be people who will want to ride behind them. Just watch them. Simply love them.